Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Innovation Exchange Series. This is a virtual conversation series hosted by the Sustainable Health Initiative at the Yale Institute for Global Health and Innovate Health Yale at the Yale School of Public Health. We are so thrilled to host these events for the Yale community of health innovators and to welcome participants from our network outside of Yale to join our events. Please use the chat to introduce yourself to the speakers and other attendees. You may also use the chat to ask questions. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the conversation and then we'll select a few questions towards the end of this presentation for our guests and our moderator to answer the quest. In public health and global health, a context of the challenges that we work the challenges that we work to address are critical, and it's important to understand the long-standing histories where we work. Uh, in light of that, Yale University acknowledges that Indigenous peoples and nations, including Mohican, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Shattuck, Golden Hill, Pogasset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquian, Algonquian speaking peoples have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this Yale Institute for Global Health defines global health by these four factors. The YHPH is a university-wide effort to address global health issues and serves as the focus point for research, education, and engagement with global partners to improve the health of individuals. I'm excited to introduce our speakers and our moderator for today. Uh, Dr. One of our first speaker is Dr. Sunita Maheshwari, who is the co-founder and chief dreamer of the Telerad Group. She's a U.S. board-certified pediatric cardiologist who did a residency in pediatrics and fellowship in pediatric cardiology at Yale New Haven Hospital. While here, she won the winner of the Young Clinician Award from the American Heart Association and the Best Teacher Award at Yale. She was nominated to be one of the top 20 women achievers in medicine in India and sits on the boards of HDSV Bank, Glasgow Smith Klein India, and is also a mentor in residence for the Sustainable Health Initiative. Joining her is Dr. Arjun Kalyanpur who is the CEO and founder of Teleradiology Solutions, also known as its chief pusher. Dr. Kalyanpur was trained at Ames, New Delhi, Cornell University Medical Center, and Yale University. He is an active contributor to scientific literature, has edited a radiology textbook, serves as a reviewer for several radiology journals, and is on the editorial board for the Indian Journal of Radiology. He was awarded the Modern Medicare Entrepreneur of the Year Award in 2007, was named one of the 50 Pathfinders in Healthcare in India by Express Healthcare Magazine, and one of the 25 healthcare influencers by Healthcare Executive, and won Frost and Sullivan's Healthcare Entrepreneur of the Year Award. Together, Dr. Sunita Maheshwari and Dr. Arjun Kalyan were founded India's first and largest teleradiology company that has provided over 6 million diagnostic reports to patients and hospitals globally. And they have incubated other startup companies in the telehealth space, including a chain of primary care centers in India called RxDx Healthcare and Telrad Tech, which builds the teleradiology and AI and radiology software. They also run the Telrad Foundation, which supports telehealth initiatives in India and People for People, which has put up over 500 playgrounds for poor children in India. Our moderator today is Dr. Howie Foreman. Howie is a professor of radiology, biomedical imaging, public health, health policy management, and economics at Yale University. He is the faculty director and founder of Yale's MD MBA program and the healthcare focus of the executive MBA program. Since 2011, he has been the director of the healthcare management program at the Yale School of Public Health. He is actively involved in patient care and issues related to financial administration, healthcare compliance, and quality improvement. And with that, I'll hand it over to Sunita. Thank you. Thank 
Great, should I take over then? Uh, so I'm just gonna, yeah, okay. Uh, well, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be back at uh, Yale, even though it's virtually. Um, so I'm going to, in five minutes, uh, share our 20 year journey since uh, leaving New Haven. Uh, so just so that you get a sense of what we're about, and then I'll uh, hand over to Howie. Um, so we basically, in 1999, moved back to India, um, and uh, we had finished at Yale, and we wanted to work in India. Long story short, we, Arjun couldn't get a job there, um, and so he was coming back and forth to New Haven, working at Yale uh, as an assistant professor, and on one of those trips back, uh, Dr. Jim Brink, who was the chairman at that time, said, you know, Arjun, we can't get anyone to do the night shift. And he's like, Jim, I'm not doing anything. I'll do it for you from Bangalore. Um, and it was one of those aha moments. Uh, and uh, that's how teleradiology started really uh, with no job opportunity, uh, but an opportunity from our alma mater. And so teleradiology, really the transfer of diagnostic images for interpretation. Interestingly, the first study uh, was done by Dr. Foreman and Arjun, um, and this was published in 2003. Uh, so it was first done academically, uh, where they showed that an international teleradiology model was possible. And essentially from India, we were covering India Day, which was US nights. Uh, and uh, long story short, it grew from there. We covered today 100 hospitals in the United States, uh, including uh, the University of Pennsylvania group and a lot of uh, groups, a Stewart group in the Massachusetts area, Einstein group in Philadelphia, uh, Tanner group in Georgia. Um, and we've grown beyond just the United States. Uh, so we uh, recently in 2022 signed in Qatar which is in the Middle East. So we cover the Hamad Medical Corporation and Sidra, which is the under the Ministry of Qatar. Uh, and about 10 years ago, we started with Singapore. Uh, and Singapore at that time had a, if you did an x-ray in Singapore, it used to take four days to get a report. Uh, and then implementing teleradiology, we were able to reduce that down to one hour uh, in terms of getting a report back to the patient. And using the same domain of teleradiology for America for Singapore. Uh, we started helping hospitals in India and Africa, uh, started do, providing teleradiology for state governments um, and uh, the primary health centers and rural centers in India. Uh, so same expertise that was used for the Western world, now used within Asia uh, and especially in Africa and remote parts of India. We're an academic group, we're Yalies. So, you know, even though this was a startup and a company and it wasn't, a, we weren't a university. We've published, we have over 100 publications, e-lectures, um, and uh, we have a training center in our headquarters in Bangalore, which, you know, if anyone comes to India, do come and visit. Uh, we were showcased to President Obama when he came to India as one of the innovative companies coming out of uh, the country. Um, and so we've sort of worked in this space of healthcare and healthcare innovation over the years. I think the amazing thing with entrepreneurship is that once you sort of do it once, one startup and grow it, it gives you the confidence to do more. Uh, and so we set up our second startup, which is a primary care clinic. And this came out of seeing the need for it because in India, hospitals are getting bigger and bigger, but there's not much investment in primary care primarily for financial reasons, because there is no money in primary care. But we felt this was a big need, and we set up one clinic um, 15 years ago. So we're very boring entrepreneurs. We just kind of start and stick at it. Uh, and we've expanded that. We now run seven clinics in our hometown, uh, 16 clinics inside corporates, and 19 uh, rural clinics in uh, remote parts of India, which are fidgeted. They're a mix of nurse-assisted telemedicine, and doctors going on and off. Um, we found several years ago that many parts of India and Africa, you could not, you know, patients could not access doctors. So we started doing telemedicine much before the pandemic. Uh, we, I even run a telecardiology practice covering about 15 hospitals with teleecho and telecardiology. Uh, and we used tech similarly uh, to do another startup called Healthy Minds. Uh, 
uh, amazingly over 10 million Indians, and this is pre-COVID, struggle with uh, mental health issues, uh, many more since the pandemic. Uh, and so we started providing telecounseling. This was seven years ago, probably ahead of its time. We're seeing today in the post-COVID era that many more people are open to this, to accessing their counselor online. Our third startup was a tech company. Uh, because we were doing teleradiology and telemedicine, we realized we wanted to build, we were using um, uh, outsourced software. And so we had got some engineers in house and actually built out a teleradiology workflow, which sits over wrists and packs. Uh, and we started using it for ourselves as well as for others who want it. So for instance, the Mexican Navy uh, uses this platform to cover all their sites, which are uh, you know all, all over the place. So it's very good for multi-site. Um, and then came AI. Uh, and so we were right there. So Arjun and a bunch of Indian Institute of Science guys with a very low budget, uh, we built out our first algorithm, uh, which was for auto detection of breast cancer, and then built out for auto detection of stroke. Uh, so we've been over the last four years now working on AI and radiology with a shoestring budget as we've done with everything else. Um, and the fourth startup, uh, actually, the fifth was Image Core Lab, which basically works with clinical trial companies. Um, this was set up primarily to work with clinical trial companies in India and Asia, uh, because we realized there are a lot of people helping with imaging in the US, but there are not many with uh, who have that ability in this part of the world. So we work, for instance, with um, Indian companies, we work with Singaporean companies, we've worked with the Gates Foundation in India, with we work now with other AI companies and help them with their validations. So this is a very kind of niche, uh, just the radiology part of clinical trials and uh, AI for pharma companies as well as AI companies. I think the fun part of, of building this has been for us, uh, it's been about building a fun culture. So we have a masseuse, you can see up here, uh, we have a full-time masseuse in the office. Um, we have our own band, the Teleradiators. We have a slide in the office where, you know, people can slide down. Now it's got so dirty that we say, if you, if you don't perform, we're pushing you down. But we've tried to keep it fun. Um, during COVID, obviously, things were shut. So we did like online bingo parties and, you know, keeping the energy going uh, through the years. Um, but I think of all of this, the most satisfying for us, because when we went back to India, we went back taking our training at Yale and taking the expertise that we had got at Yale. Uh, and we wanted to go back and do something with it in our home country. And for that, we are always grateful to Yale for training people like us and, you know, setting us free uh, in uh, across the world. And so giving back was very important for us. So we set up a foundation that does so for charitable hospitals. We give them free reports so they get access to high quality diagnostic reports, uh, even if they can't afford it. And this has been expanding uh, in remote parts of India and Africa. Uh, and finally, I think one thing, uh, you know, we lived in a condo in West Haven and uh, there was a tennis court there. And I remember we sort of took our tennis rackets and we went there and we asked them, how do you join this club? And we were new, we were fresh off the boat in the US and this, this guy says, do you have your racket? Do you have your tennis shoes? just come and play. And we realized that, oh my God, in America, it's, you know, public playgrounds are everywhere. That is not the case in our country. Uh, it's only the rich kids who have access to playgrounds. Uh, and so we set up um, a, a foundation that puts up playgrounds for poor children. We've put up over 500 playgrounds. Interestingly, interestingly the first playground was donated by Yaley. Uh, she was a resident with me at Yale and she did a bake sale in Seattle and sent the funds over with which the first playground got started. Um, and so, you know, that's our story. Over 20 years, we've been organically grown. Uh, we've never taken venture capital funding, uh, never been private equity funded. We've just reinvested our profits into what we believed in. Uh, and so one unemployed uh, ex Yaley Arjun in a home office, uh, did five healthcare startups, two foundations. Today, we have over 900 staff, including over 100 radiologists and 200 clinicians. Um, and uh, that's our story. And it's it's interesting. It's actually 30 years since we were at Yale. So it's like almost like the wheel has come full circle. Uh, so thank you.
Pauline and everyone for having us back and Nicole for organizing it. It's lovely to be here and over to, I guess, Corinne and then Howie. Yeah, so Sunita and Arjun actually have a really interesting video that they want to share with their other companies. And I will be so this, this, is, um, this is our latest corporate video. So just so that you get a sense of what teleradiology is all about. Teleradiology, that's the latest thing An opportunity that's better than what you can think We've come a long way when it comes to medicine We're knocking on the future now and it has let us in Yeah, so you wanna hear the vision? I recommend you sit back for a second and just listen I got a radiologist who's here and on a mission So tell us all your goals, Doc, and what do you envision? Well, I wanna serve the world and do good, that's a fact Save lives of the people, make a difference and impact I wanna help patients, anyone who's in need And I'm doing just that right in front of my screen Anywhere in the world, I can work, I can read These scans and reports, I send and receive Saving one life, <laughs> can you please? I just saved like 40 right there on that seat A pandemic may come, a pandemic may go No, the work will go on, that is for sure At TRS, you are never alone So tell me what exactly is it that you're waiting for? Come join the vision, let's make a difference Stay at home and social distance the perfect job the perfect goal you see why i never want to quit you i feel at home now this the 21st century let's make some memories time to get on board and be the happiest you'll ever be a boring day at work that's a thing you'll never see come and join the family once you join you'll never leave quick turnaround times yeah tats provide service with top-notch quality the best of the best in radiology that's telly radiology Am I on or is Arjun going to speak? I just want to make sure I'm following directions. <laughs> I, uh, well, I'll just, I'll just step in and say, first of all, your son is very talented. Uh, I've, uh, I've uh, only heard once before from him and he's very talented and you all are very talented. Um, and let me just say a couple of quick mo uh, thoughts about what it was like to have Arjun here uh, 23 years ago. Without Arjun and his colleague Jamal Bakari, uh, we would not have been able to start the country's first 24 by 7 emergency uh, radiology service. Um, we did something great at that time, and uh, it was the two of them working 365 nights during the year and got us started. And we have always been uh, deeply appreciative of the connection that we've had with Arjun uh, and, and with you, Sunita, um, since that time. And I'll also just point out to everyone your deep commitment to be bringing back the training that you had in America back to uh, India. I remember extremely well conversations with Arjun uh, at the time he was making the decision to leave and go back. It was not going back because there was some amazing job there. It was going back because there was so much good that you could do there. Um, and that that was the priority and you stuck with that and you've raised the family and uh, both a, a real family, a biological family and also a uh, corporate family there and you've made a huge difference. So just my own congratulations and appreciation to both of you. Um, I want to start off, you know, Arjun and I had a chance to talk for about an hour yesterday in person for the first time in several years. I think we had run into each other at RSNA sometime in the last decade, but it was the first time in several years I'd seen him in person. Uh, we got to talk for a while. One thing he kept emphasizing to me is how much of a difference Yale had made in his life and your life, not, not just in the educational component, but in how it changed you as a person. Can you both reflect, maybe starting with Origin, on how uh, Yale itself has changed you and hopefully made you a better person and better prepared for these opportunities? Absolutely. You're muted, Origin. 
um, from actually speaking through. Can you hear me? Yeah. Now I can. So, um, you know, absolutely how Yale is for us where it all began and we cannot uh, adequately express our feelings in terms of what we've gotten from Yale, um, starting with, of course, the, the concept of, of teleradiology. Uh, but even before that, I think that the training that we underwent at Yale, and for me, it, uh, personally, I was a very uh, shy person when I first came to Yale and, and standing up in a resident conference, taking cases uh, and having to think on my feet, I think that gave me a, a lot of analytic skills as a radiologist. Uh, and uh, obviously the, the training from the faculty was outstanding. Uh, and the experience that I gained during that year in the emergency department was, was absolutely key to uh, making me the radiologist that I subsequently became an animal today. Uh, and of course, the, um, what Sunita showed in the, in the slides, uh, the, the whole the, the spark that set it off was that conversation with Jim uh, Brink, who was chairman at the time, uh, where I proposed the concept of doing this work from, you know, from overseas, and we did it as a research project of which you were a, a co-author. Uh, and I think that that really gave the proof of concept that such a thing was possible. This is back in the days when, uh, you know, even before the internet had really taken off. So we were really in a very different world back then. But to uh, the support that I got from from you and Jim and uh, Bruce in, back then was was, was critical to uh, in making the uh, building the confidence that this was something that would work. Uh, so I think many there are many many things to be grateful for. Uh, from my from my perspective, um, so yeah, I would say Howie, you know, as a as a global student, when you come to Yale, I mean, uh, you know, when you're brown and you come on campus, uh, we were very intimidated, and you're sort of this brown skin in a very white place, um, and I and I think what uh, uh, what students like us got out of there was we were forced to think. We were forced to speak up. I, I remember Norm Siegel at, uh, in pediatrics. He would ask a question and I knew the answer and I would just mumble. And he would say, speak up. And I think for Americans, it's probably natural. Maybe in school, they're taught to speak up. But for, uh, for, for Asians, it's, it's not part of our culture. And I think that was, a, that was invaluable because we learned to communicate. Uh, and as entrepreneurs, you have to be able to communicate your idea, your vision, what you're aiming to do. Uh, and I think if we hadn't spent all those years at Yale, that wouldn't have happened. And the second thing I would say Yale gave us is um, it, it taught selflessly. Um, you know, you, you, we, 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 like we, everyone always knew we were going back. And yet we got the best education. And I remember Charlie Kleinman telling me, take this education and take it to India. You know, do good with it. Uh, and I think that that generosity um, that the university has to to take people and then send them, let them spread their wings around the world, uh, is an American is an is a wonderful part of actually the American system. Um, and I, I think it's it's created uh, therefore ambassadors all across the world. Uh, and I think thirdly that uh, the the teaching us to think. Um, you know, that that ability to think and think out of the box and think of solutions, as Arjun said, learning to think on your feet, that came in real handy as an entrepreneur, where you're constantly having to find solutions because something or the other isn't going right. Um, and you're, you're sort of thinking about, you know, how do I get out of this mess and figure it out? So I think, uh, you know, a lot of learnings from our time really uh, at Yale. And we, we always recommend it to, uh, you know, people to go and have that experience of, uh, of working and studying in another, in another country, if they can get into Yale, of course, there. That's great. We're going to, I just want to remind people, we're going to start taking questions in about 10 minutes, maybe less if you have them. So please send your questions in and we're happy to sort of read them out. Um, you know, there are people on there. There's people on there. Now I have an echo. Sorry. Um, the um, there are some individuals on the call who are radiologists. There are some who are public health students and others who are already professionals working out there. And 
a lot of them are, I think, a little afraid of what it's like to do what you did. I mean, you you started something from scratch with your own resources. As you said, you didn't have investors, you didn't have venture capital, private equity, you've scaled up on your own. Um, uh, Arjun and I have talked about the fact that it's not as though you couldn't have cashed out early on. You could have, you had offers along the way. Uh, Tell us a little about what goes on in your mind as you're building a business like this. What is the long-term objective? Where do you want to get to? Um, and and you know, is there some point at which you would sell the company or sell it to others? So, how that's an interesting question. I think we've done some soul searching along those lines, and the way we have always thought is that um, we. We were, you know, we were getting calls from investors from as early as our very first year of our existence. In fact, when we were about a year old, we had a big tech company come uh, knocking at the door saying that they would like to buy us out. And uh, it was a very tempting offer at the time. It was a, an offer of a million dollars. And we actually asked them, we said, what exactly are you buying here? Because it was basically one radiologist in the room <laughs> reading on a computer. And they said, we want to buy the idea. And uh, so we actually thought about it and we spoke with our board and the board said, why would you need to sell your company to a tech company, which should really be your vendor rather than your owner? Uh, and that was very sage advice. So we said, uh, thank you, but no thank you to the, to the prospective buyers. And we, you know, it's looking back, it's, it was clearly the right decision at the time. Uh, but, but I think that that taught us that the idea is really something that had potential. If somebody, uh, you know, uh, billion dollar corporation could see the potential in it, even in that fledgling stage, when we were ourselves underconfident about it, that gave us the assurance and the confidence to take it forward. Um, and as you've seen, it's led to a, a slew of other uh, entrepreneurial activities, which have independently brought tremendous fulfillment and satisfaction. Of course, the primary teleradiology business, which is the, the reporting of scans from hospitals around the world, is I think where we feel we can make the greatest impact because we have, uh, you know, the skill set to, to do it. Um, so, so 20 years down, I think we're, we're, we're in a different situation. We, uh, we, we still, you know, we, we, we have the, the, the maturity now to be able to take this company forward. How exactly to do that is, is an area which we are, uh, you know, thinking about. And uh, I think there's a lot of exciting opportunities out there for us. Uh, which, which, uh, which, 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 we honestly, even though we're 20 years old, we have this feeling that it's only just begun. So <laughs> let's take it. Yeah, no, I, I think that's an interesting question, uh, Howie. And we did it, you know, there are times we have FOMO, uh, the fear of missing out, you know, because there are startups, even in India, who've raised like obscene amounts of money in healthcare, $200 million on a PPT. And we're like, what, are, what exactly are we doing like 20 years of this with our own money reinvesting? But we felt very strongly, I think, about two things. That one, healthcare needs to be, you know, it shouldn't be about just about money. While yes, you want to make profits and be sustainable, uh, healthcare needs someone who's willing to be, you know, kind of ride it out and do it well. Uh, so that's one thing that's always kept us. So all the PE guys are our friends. And we say when we're ready to sell, we'll let you know, but we don't want to take your money and have, you know, have you force us to grow in a way we don't want to in healthcare. Uh, and interestingly, when we didn't take the buyout offer, 10 years later, we got profiled uh, in Forbes India uh, by one of, uh, and, uh, one of India's leading entrepreneurs. And he, the article was, why not to sell your company? And uh, one thing he said is that money very early on in the life of an organization can be a one-way ticket to obscurity. Uh, and I, I, I think that's something that stuck with us. If we had sold, I, we wouldn't be here today. You know, we would, we would just, so, so I, I think in healthcare in particular, we strongly believe there shouldn't be too much money. Uh, um, there, there should be little bits, but it should be more about sort of driving operational efficiencies for a long time. So, but will we ever change our mind? Maybe, I, I, we've learned also to never say never. Uh, one does, you know, if there's at some point a PE exit and we decide to come teach at Yale, then maybe we take it, you know, who knows? Yeah, 
there's a question already in the chat um, that I'm going to use as as the basis for my question here, and that is that. Um, and again, this is something that Arjun and I have talked about for the United States, but I'm going to ask it more globally, and that is you're operating in a lot of different parts of the world now, um, both both the services you provide are in lots of places in the world, and I think your readers are not just in India anymore, or, or I may have that wrong, but you can fill that in for us. How do you deal with the regulatory climate where it's different in different countries and where you have to meet different needs? Do you develop your own subject matter expertise? Do you rely on consultants? How do you manage that? So you're absolutely right, Howie. We're now a global organization, and this is something that's evolved uh, over the last 20 years. At the beginning, we had this model of having uh, radiologists like myself who trained in the US working from uh, you know, a time zone that, uh, like, such as the Asian time zone, which gave the midday night advantage. But over the years, we've also realized that uh, we needed radiologists in different continents to provide different types of services. So we now have radiologists in the US, we have radiologists in Europe, we have in the Middle East, we have in uh, Australia and New Zealand, we, they're basically around the world. Uh, and that allows us to serve different geographies, and different time zones, it provides a lot of uh, advantages. Uh, from the perspective of how we deal with the regulatory stuff, it, it is dependent on the country and the country's requirements. So before we um, you know, enter into a country, we study the regulations for that country. Some of it is done in consultation with the prospective client. Uh, and uh, based on that, we develop a framework. So, for instance, we found that many of the hospitals in, in, the, in the Middle East are, uh, they, they are uh, willing to accept under their medical staff radiologists who have done the fellowship of the Royal College of Radiologists. So we have a cohort of FRCR radiologists who provide services in the Middle East. Similarly, um, you know, for the centers we serve within India, we have radiologists who are trained locally within the country. So depending on the geography and depending on the specific requirements, obviously in the United States, our radiologists have to be board certified, licensed in the state that we're providing the services and uh, credentialed at the hospital as well. So it's a much longer process in the US to get a radiologist on board and it can take several months. So the so there is, a, all that has to be factored into building an operations in, in an international teleradiology practice. Great. Um, I don't want to step on uh, um, Corinne's role here, but uh, the questions that are coming in are very relevant to our radiology. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to just continue to work off of those. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, so the next question relates to AI. And as you both know, AI has already started to have a major role in radiology, and it's a major part of your business and the things that you're working on. What Can you give us some prognostications on what you think AI is going to do for your business, as well as the greater practice of radiology and even medicine in the United States in the next decade or so? Absolutely. So uh, I think, how you, uh, it's interesting along several perspectives. One is that uh, teleradiology, when we started 20 years ago, uh, we've kind of seen the cycle that it followed. Teleradiology was one measure to address the radiologist shortage. And uh, AI is the next step forward in that direction. So we've kind of seen the, the, the way the industry functions in this regard. Uh, you know, to give you an example, the first RSNA we participated in, there were three teleradiology companies. The following year, there were 30. And it kept going like that. And of course, a lot of them shut down. So in, in, in the AI space, there's a similar excitement and you know, the, the, the entrepreneurial energy around AI is similarly directed. But fundamentally, I think AI and teleradiology are very synergistic. And there is a multiplicative factor that I believe teleradiology has to offer with AI. So the algorithms that are developed, and uh, they can be developed anywhere in any country by any engineer, if they are integrated within a teleradiology workflow platform, they can be made available on the largest possible scale and make the largest possible impact. So we strongly believe that teleradiology will act as a distribution force that will magnify the uh, impact of AI. And, and that's what we are ourselves practicing. Our own uh, workflow that we have developed uh, in our technology group is uh, integrated with, with AI uh, algorithms some of which we have developed in-house, some of which have been developed by other third parties. And so it acts, uh, and, and you know, I like to use the iPhone analogy, the, 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 the app on the iPhone is, is the AI on our teleradiology workflow. 
uh, and, and it makes it available to the largest possible uh, both user base as well as provides impact to the largest possible uh, clinical uh, population. Yeah, and if I can add to that, Howie, you know, when we started teleradiology, one of the criticisms of it was that, oh, these Indian guys are going to take away the American jobs. And that never happened, as you know, right? We just supplemented, we cover the night shift, we let the guy at night, you know, in, sleep at night. Um, and so very much we were supplementary. And the same is happening today with AI. Everyone's like, oh, is AI going to take the radiologist job away? And the way we see it, that it's actually going to make the radiologists more, if there's a huge shortage anyway worldwide, they're not able to train them fast enough. It's going to make the radiologist much more efficient. So he'll be able to do more with his time and it'll, it'll make him more accurate. I mean, there's an estimate that 20 million radiology reports per year have inaccuracies. Uh, and so if AI can drop that, so if it can make it more accurate and make the radiologist more efficient, so we don't see it as ever... Well, we don't know. Again, never say never. But as it replacing, but rather collaborating with uh, and helping the doc uh, over the years to come. Uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, by the way, about AI. I mean, we use a lot of AI in our own department right now. And I see it as only a benefit to the patient. And there's no no downside now. And I'm not a, a, a worried about uh, the jobs walking away because there's a lot of work to be done. Um, you know, both of you have alluded to, and Arjun and I talked about it briefly yesterday, um, the issues around um, offshoring of jobs, which has been a perpetual uh, political concern. And right now we're at a time in America where economic nationalism is heightened again, and both parties are embracing aspects of economic nationalism. Uh, I'm wondering if either of you want to comment, because I, I feel like both of you have always handled this so uh, delicately and, and calmly, whereas many other people might get angry. And just so the audience understands, you know, Arjun was a trained radiologist at Yale. He was an attending at Yale. He was trained, had his credentials at Yale. Everything was at Yale. And people would treat his reports differently based on where he was sitting when he read the study. So that if he read the study at Yale, they loved Arjun because he was one of us. But if he was reading the study in Bangalore, he was a foreigner uh, stealing work from us. And why should we trust him? And I, I got to experience that as an administrator. And it made me very angry uh, at the time, many, many times. Um, but you both, and particularly Arjun, always handle this extremely well. I'm wondering, how do you manage that sort of calmness and equanimity? And... <laughs> Not always calm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's the other side as well. But um, I think, Howie, you're, 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 it's a very good question. And, and I think our philosophy has always been uh, that there will always be naysayers and people who have concerns and objections. But... Uh, fundamentally, if you if you know what you're doing is a good thing, you should just put your nose to the wheel and continue doing it, and let everything else take care of itself. And so we followed that philosophy over the years, um, I, I, and I think it's held us in good stead thus far. Um, that that's essentially the gist of it. Yeah, I, I think yeah, I think our learning has been how we like you just put your nose to the ground and work. And, you know, work on operational efficiencies, work on the quality of your work, and the rest speaks for itself. So, uh, but you, you're you right. I mean, the, in the early years, the challenges were more related to race yes. uh, than to anything else. I mean, yes. we, we used to very proudly put on our website, you know, we're based in India. Then we took that down and we said we're based globally. Uh, yeah. But, you know, I, I think the, the good thing is we've seen in 20 years, the world has gotten flatter. Um no radiologists lost their jobs because of us. In fact, you know, right, as I right. said, we compliment them. Um, and uh, and there's a, there is, a, uh, for instance, you know, Mass General, we run their 3D lab in Bangalore for them. Um, and uh, they, they, we've, they, we've, they've been running it in India now for 15 years. And Arjun was just at in, up in Boston two days ago. And uh, Gordon told him that they have so much work, they don't know where to send it anymore because the machines have gotten, you know, faster and more slices. Right. So our realization has been that you know, ultimately it doesn't matter. 
that you know in the short run people sort of look at that but ultimately if you if you work hard and you show your work proves itself then the rest kind of fades into oblivion so you sort of have to be as you said stay calm and carry on yes it's a good way to put it what one of my colleagues at Yale is a uh, radiologist has asked a question about um, HIPAA compliance. And I know, again, or I feel like we did a pre-interview yesterday, Arjun, because you gave me all the answers. Now I need you to tell the audience, but um, how have you maintained privacy concerns, HIPAA concerns, uh, and, and the similar types of concerns in other countries, because HIPAA is United States rule. Uh, what are the things that you did at the beginning? Or what are the things that you do now to maintain the integrity and privacy of the patient record and their imaging? So uh, interestingly, how the uh, U.S. standard is always the U.S. has always led, you know, in terms of technology. So if you're HIPAA compliant, then you're HIPAA compliant, whether you're HIPAA compliant in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world. So most other geographies also accept that standard. So it's not as big of an issue as one might think. Now Europe has its own set of standards, and that's something that you know we've had to uh, look into over the years with GDPR and so on. So uh, for, especially with the technology platform, we've had to establish. Uh, different security processes and standards for Europe, but by and large, the you know the HIPAA compliance is a, is today more or less a global standard from the perspective of if, if you're HIPAA compliant, you can operate anywhere in the world. It doesn't change country by country. And and to that point, I I remember you telling me yesterday that uh, the original box that you were using to store the images and allow transfer of images, you had a card key to access it so that yes. nobody could be walking by and, and right. do anything with our studies. Exactly. Yeah. So when we first set up the Yale project, uh, even though it was from an, you know, a, a room in my home, <laughs> I had set up the entire in the security infrastructure, including the, uh, the biometric uh, fingerprint detector to enter the office and the uh, the, the security box so that it was complete uh, security. So it really doesn't matter in that sense where you're located. I think this this concept is, is sometimes uh, again held up as a, a criticism of teleradiology. But you know we've seen that you can have uh, data hacks from within the United States. We I remember we once had a client uh, where some somebody came and stole CDs from their center. So that, that sort of physical stuff can happen anywhere. You can be extremely insecure while within uh, the United States. So you can be extremely secure while outside. It's ultimately a right. matter of approach. The, the next question I think is for Sunita, um, or, or at least I would ask Sunita that question. And that is, you know, you've done so much to disrupt radiology. Uh, have you thought about things that are well outside the realm of radiology, like primary care? How might you disrupt that? Have you given thought to it? What can we do? Yeah, no, uh, it's interesting how because when I, you know I trained at Yale as a pediatric cardiologist, so when I came back to India, I worked at a uh, what's called a tertiary care hospital, which we will we, I worked at the largest pediatric cardiac center in the country. So we were operating on ten kids a day. I mean, it was a massive program. I was doing seven cats a day, so it was very super specialty. I was like far removed from primary care. Um, and I, I realized sitting in the outpatient of that big heart hospital that patients would be coming to see me with a small VSD and sitting for eight hours to see a cardiologist. And then you, you kind of take one step back to, you know, beyond specialists, to physicians. Uh, and most uh, physicians in India, in what are called MBBS, which is your basic MD, uh, were leaving India because there, there, were, there were not enough see, seats to get specialized. Like we have 98,000 medical graduates a year in India. We had at the time only 30,000 specialty seats. So you've got 60,000 doctors who are primary care technically because they've not specialized and they're not getting jobs. And on the other hand, you have all these patients who just have you know, they just have a cold, they just have malaria and they have dengue and they don't need to be in a hospital seeing an infectious disease specialist. They need a good general physician, but there are not many platforms for general physicians, unlike China, which worked on barefoot doctors. Uh, India, the MBBS doctors were leaving. I mean, that's why 30% right. of doctors in America are Indian. Um, so that's actually why we first, when teleradiology was going on, I told Arjun, I think this country needs primary care. And I don't understand it because I am like a super, super specialist. 
but we got on board physicians. In fact, we landed up getting internists trained in the US who'd moved back similar to us to India and who believed in primary care. And so we set up this, this uh, you know, what we run is essentially primary care um, because it's, it's completely GP driven, general physician driven, the family physician. And in India, the reason it hasn't taken off is because like in the rest of the world, there is economics in healthcare. Um, and so the hospitals where you're doing heart surgeries and you know uh, cancer and PET CTs, those make money. Whereas primary care, you charge basically for a consultation, uh, it's $8. Uh, and then the clinic gets to keep $2. <clears throat> so in that $2, you've got to maintain a primary care center. So it's pure economics, why it hasn't taken off. But I think it's ripe for disruption. Uh, and uh, we found we are a bit positive. So there's obviously a need for primary care. Right. Um, I just want to mention, to, so first of all, we have a few minutes left. And if you have questions, ask them. Uh, I was just looking back and remembering that two separate articles in the New York Times were written about you all uh, in 2003 and 2004. And you just have to type in your names and uh, New York Times to find them. I won't, won't put them in the chat. <laughs> here, but um, for those that may not appreciate it, like what you have done is, remains monumental. I mean, you did things that are very unusual for um, uh, physicians at the time. And most physicians from India have stayed in the United States. Um, uh, and, and most physicians that go back to India do not become sort of celebrities and entrepreneurs what, what advice would you give to young people today about how, how to make decisions like that that will be, that will hopefully not just do good for you, but do good for so many others? Yeah, Arjun, you want to start off? <laughs> yeah, I think how it's interesting when we went back, everyone told us we would return from JFK. All our friends at Yale were like, uh, I think you said, you told Arjun also, your crazy wife is taking you back. You're I never back. said crazy wife, but I definitely, <laughs> but I, I did tell you that he would always be welcome back. I yes, always said that, that it doesn't matter how long you're gone, <laughs> I will always have you back. So that yes, I could you, sure you did. And you know, it was, it was, I, I mean, really, I, I have to say that was wonderful because when you go back into the unknown and, uh, and Arjun couldn't get a job in India for three years, um, it was nice to know that, you know, we could come back if we wanted to. So all our friends used to make fun of us. They're like, you're going to be back. You'll turn around at JFK, you six months, you'll come back in one year. But I think, you know, if anyone chooses this path, sometimes you can't think too much about it. I mean, if we had thought that we're going to go back and we're not going to get a job and our parents are going to be like, what are you doing back here? We both had uh, great offers at Duke as well for faculty positions. So sometimes you can't think too much. You have to sort of follow your heart. And I think our heart took us back there. Um, I would say for anyone who's, uh, you know, in global, because, you know, this is for the the School of Global Health, but anyone who wants to do something globally, um, it's it's important to go back and actually work on the ground. And I think that's what helped us eventually, for sure, me working locally, then you understand, uh, you know, what, what the needs are, where you can fit in, what you can do. Um, and, uh, you know, and then doing it, even if it's on a, uh, as I said, we, we've had FOMO, but more or less, we've been happy starting small, um, and then sort of being patient, uh, because I think a lot of times uh, when we're young, we're impatient for results. Um, and we, we sort of want it all to happen. If we're going to do a startup, then that startup has to be a, a unicorn in a couple of years. And it doesn't happen, especially in healthcare. Uh, so I think patience and just sort of saying, you know, I, I want to go back because I want to do good uh, and I will figure out a way to do it. Uh, and one thing we at least, uh, I mean, both Arjun and I do a lot of talks in India and a lot of young people ask us, we want to be entrepreneurs, you know, what should we do? So I always say, please keep your day job. You know, uh, it's too stressful uh, not having a job, not having money and trying to be an entrepreneur and hoping you'll hit the lottery and hoping your idea is a multi-million dollar idea. You may get lucky and that may happen, 
Uh, but it's important to sort of keep the day job at, while you're thinking and trying different things. It's nice to have a partner, a co-founder. I would say we've been lucky. We've had, you know, each other. We do strategy walks, uh, morning <laughs> walks, our strategy, solution finding, sort of we walk for an hour talking about things. So we don't even have to do strategy sessions. Uh, so I, I think it's um, it's it's definitely today, I would say it's it's much easier in a sense, a lot of opportunities. And globally, people are looking uh, if someone went to the Yale School of Global Health or Yale School of Public Health and wanted to come back, there are many more opportunities today. So it's good to also try. I think the way we did it, I wouldn't recommend that you show up and then try and get a job and then not get a job and then, you know, be like, oh, my God, now what? So but today you, when you're in a position of strength in the U.S., you know, reaching out to their multiple agencies that give jobs, multiple hospitals that give jobs, and then starting sort of building on from there. Uh, and if one wants to be entrepreneurial, uh, you know, there are several different ways, I would say, to do it, from angel investing to just using your salary to, to build out something. Arjun, final words before we uh, turn it back over to Corinne? I would just add to that, Howie, that um, I think I've, I've learned over the years that persistence is probably the most single most important thing in entrepreneurship because, you know, you're going to have a bunch of challenges thrown at you. I mean, it's like you, you were saying yesterday, you were saying that you, you, you can't choose the cards you get dealt, right? So you, you will be dealt some unfortunate cards. But having that, that kind of attitude that I will persist no matter what and stick it out, uh, I, I think is very helpful as an entrepreneur, especially in healthcare, where the challenges can be quite, um, you know, quite uh, daunting at times. So um, we and and we've had we've had our share of them, starting from the technology challenges to the the whole anti outsourcing movement. I mean, we, we faced our, our share of challenges over the years, and I think just being positive in, in attitude is is really important to see you through those uh, difficult times and keeping the the goal in mind. I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of both of you in general and, and so much for today alone. So I'm and, and thankful for your friendship as well. Let me turn it over to, to Corinne and Fatima and, and the team. Thank you, Howie. Thank you so much. Thank you, Howie. Thanks very much. I'm looking Thanks, Howie. Um... Arjun and Sumia for this insightful conversation. Um, if anyone has any follow-up questions, um, do you mind sharing your contact information in chat so people can reach out? Sure. So one of you yeah. can share your email. Um, and thanks everyone for being here and asking the questions. We do have another event coming up in the spring semester featuring Emily Sheldon, who is the co-founder of the African Health Innovation Center. And she will be talking about assistive technologies and disability advocacy in emerging markets. And I will also be dropping the details in the chat. Um, for those who are interested, feel free to check out uh, more resources on the YHH website. And that, that's it for our session. And thank you all for attending. Have thank a nice you day. Thanks, Karu. I think there's someone from Bye. Sri Lanka asked about Delhi. So I'm just going to reply to that, that you can just email us and we'll send you the details. So happy to help Sri Lanka. So, and right, Dina, I'll put my email in there. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Howie. Thank you. Stay and well. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao, ciao. See you soon, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> ciao, ciao.